good afternoon students i hope all of you are doing good and i hope your preparation is going fine welcome to today's analyst this is 6th of february 2024 and we are here to discuss important articles from the hindu and the indian express now the handout of the session is there in the description box you may utilize it to streamline your current affairs preparation and the first topic of today is in relation to the big all india exam leak the second topic is in relation to monetary policy committee Third topic, a very important topic, is in relation to Myanmar's civil war and India's interest. And last but not the least, we'll be discussing about snow leopard. So coming to the first topic. Now the first topic of today is in relation to the big All India exam leak. Now Union Minister Jitendra Singh have introduced the Public Examination Prevention of Unfair Means Bill 2024 in the Lok Sabha. Now, in our General Studies Paper 2, Issues Relating to Development and Management of Social Sector, the word education has been categorically mentioned. So, in relation to this, this topic becomes very, very important. Now, let us understand this All India Exam League, this big All India Exam League, with the help of certain statistics. So, as you can see the India's map over here, close to 15 states have witnessed exam leak in the past 7 to 8 years. And there have been leaks in 41 job recruitment exams. So let's take example of Jammu and Kashmir. There have been leaks in three public examinations, which is having close to 2300 posts, which is impacting close to two and a half lakh of the population. Now let us take the example of Rajasthan. There was leak in a seven public examinations, close to 40,500 posts were there, and it will impact close to 38.5 lakh population that is 38.5 lakh students population so with this we are getting to know a cumulative score that more than 1.5 crore students have been affected due to this all india exam leak from 2016 to 2020 2023 from 2016 to 2023 close to 1.5 crore students have been impacted due to this all india exam leak now, more than 70 cases of question paper leak have come forward from 2016 to 2023. And at least a dozen recruitments, that is more than 12 recruitments, drives have been cancelled due to these paper leaks from 2018 to 2023. Now, since 2014, close to 615 accused have been arrested in the case of these leaks and 33 cases have been registered. So this is the statistics which tells us that this all India exam leak is very, very big and it is impacting more than 1.5 crore students in the entire country, which is a very, very big problem. Now, in order to solve this problem, first thing which we need to know is that in India, we are having no specific law catering to the unfair means or offenses in public examination. So that is why a bill has been tabled in Lok Sabha. That is your Public Examination Prevention of Unfair Means Bill 2024. Now, what is the objective of this bill? The objective of the bill is very clear that it wants to bring transparency, fairness and credibility in the public examination system of our country. Now, the question is that on which exams this bill will be applicable. So, applicability will be on a central recruitment exams, which are conducted by your UPSC, either by your UPSC, or by your SSC, or by your RRBs, that is Railway Recruitment Boards, or your IBPS, that is Institute of Banking Personal Selection, or the central examinations which are conducted by the NTA, National Testing Agency. So, for example, your JEE, then NEET, and CUET examinations will also come under the purview of this Act. And whom does this Act covers? It covers the persons, any people, or organized groups or institutions which are being involved in unfair means for any wrongful or monetary gains. So now we know what is the objective of this bill, what is the applicability and what is the coverage. Now one more suggestion for all of you, uh, rather than covering the bill in detail, first of all we should wait for the bill to be converted into an act. So when a act is passed, then it becomes very, very important for our examination. But we should give a cursory glance to the bill as well. We should be cursorily knowing what is the what are the provisions which are enshrined in the bill. But after it becomes an act, then it becomes a furthermore very important for us to cover. That is why we are very cursorily reading and understanding about the bill. Right? So what are the punishments which have been enshrined in the bill? So three to five years prison term have been listed right in the case of paper leaks 
and if those paper leaks are linked to organized crime then the limit will be 10 years of imprisonment right in normal cases and normal cases of paper leak the prison term might be from three to five years in cases of paper leaks which are linked to organized crime it can be up to 10 years and also there can be a fine of 1 CR up to the tune of 1 CR and recovering the cost of conducting examination as well. And who will conduct the investigation? Investigation will be conducted by an officer who is not below the rank of DSP or ACP. So it will be conducted by an officer who is not below the rank of the DSP or ACP. Which means it will be conducted by an officer of a senior rank. And also there is one more provision under the bill that is a high level national technical committee on public examination will be made. So a high level committee, national technical committee for public examination per se will be made under this bill. And it will give recommendations to the government to make the exams more secure and how they can be conducted in a more secure way. So that's in, in relation to the big all India exam leak. You should know about this and further developments associated with the bill also, you should keep an eye on. Now coming on to the second topic, that is in relation to monetary policy of India. Now this is a very, very important topic. Why? Because RBI's monetary policy committee is scheduled to meet from February 6 to February 8. Now in relation to a general studies paper 3, Indian economy, this topic becomes very, very important. Okay, so understanding about the monetary policy of India. Now whenever we use this term monetary policy, by Reserve Bank of India, we are essentially saying that this is the monetary policy of the central bank of that country. So there are two terms. One is your fiscal policy, right? Now, whenever we hear this term fiscal policy, we associate it with the economic policies of the central government of that country. And whenever we are using the term monetary policy, we associate it with the central bank of that country, right? So fiscal policy is associated with the economic policy of central government. Monetary policy is associated with the economic policy of the central bank of a country. And in India, the central bank is the Reserve Bank of India. That is why the monetary policy is the economic policy or set of economic policies which are set on by the Reserve Bank that is the central bank of our country that is India. Now, what all key components and elements are there of this monetary policy? We'll be trying to understand them one by one. So, let's start with the term which is repo rate. Now, simply speaking, repo rate is the rate at which central bank of a country, that is RBI of the country, that is RBI, it lends money to the commercial banks. So, repo rate is the rate at which RBI lends money to the commercial banks in our country. Now, it is a tool which is used to combat inflation in our country. Now, let's say there is a condition of inflation. That means prices are very, very high. Now, inflation means that a money supply in the economy is high. Then only inflation can be there. If money supply is high, in order to combat inflation, of course, RBI needs to lower down the money supply. How will they lower down the money supply? They will increase the repo rate. If they will increase the repo rate, that means the rate charged when RBI is giving money to the commercial banks, then when the commercial bank is giving money to the people, they will also increase the interest rates. And when they increase the interest rates, loan become very, 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 very expensive for the public. And if loans are expensive for the public, eventually money supply is going to be declining because people won't be able to take money from the banks as loans. And if that is the case, then inflation will be combated. So that is how repo rate as a tool of monetary policy is used by Reserve Bank of India. Now, there are two ratios. One ratio is CRR and one is SLR. CRR means cash reserve ratio. Now, cash reserve ratio means that certain portion of the total deposits should be kept as reserves in the form of cash. Again, I'm repeating certain portion of the total deposits by the commercial banks should be kept as reserves in the form of cash with the RBI. So CRR, it is the reserves which have to be maintained by the commercial banks with RBI in the form of cash. That is your CRR. What is SLR? SLR is statutory liquidity ratio. 
So it is the reserves of liquid assets. It is the reserves of your liquid assets which have to be maintained as reserves by the commercial banks but with themselves. So again, CRR and SLR both are reserves. CRR involves keeping reserves in the form of cash by the commercial banks with the RBI. SLR involves keeping reserves of liquid assets with themselves in the form of reserves. So keeping reserves in the form of liquid assets with the commercial banks themselves, that is your statutory liquidity ratio. Now again, let's take a case that inflation is very high in the economy. Now, if inflation is high, that means money supply is high. Now, if RBI wants to combat inflation, they will want to reduce the money supply. If they would want to reduce the money supply, they will increase the amount of reserves which need to be kept with the commercial banks. If Because if the commercial banks will keep more percentage as reserves, then less proportion would be left for them to be given as loans. And if they give less portion of loans, money supply will be coming down and eventually inflation will be combated. So that is your CRR and SLR. Now the third policy instrument under this monetary policy is your open market operation. Now open market operation is the simplest of all, whereby in open market operation, the RBI, it buys or sells the government-based securities. So it's buying or selling government securities in this open market operations. Now in what case they will buy the government securities and in what case they will sell the government securities. So let's say again there is inflation in the economy. That means money supply is higher. Now if money supply is higher they want to reduce the money supply. RBI would want to reduce the money supply. That will be the goal in order to combat inflation. If they want to combat inflation, they want to reduce money supply, they will, what they will do? They will sell the government securities to the market. If they sell the government securities to the market, the money would be coming to the Reserve Bank of India. And in that way, money supply in the economy would be coming down. And if money supply comes down, eventually inflation will be combated. But let's say there is deflation. Money supply is very, very less and we want to increase the money supply. In that case, Reserve Bank of India will buy the government securities from the public and will pump in money to the public, whereby increasing the money supply and leading to inflation. So we will be combating deflation if we buy, if the RBI buys the government securities in the open market. I hope this is very, very clear to all of you. Now the next one is margin requirement. Now margin requirement is nothing but the difference between the loan amount which we get and the collateral amount which we give. So for example, I want a 100 CR loan. I have to give in collateral to the tune of let's say 110 CR in order to get 100 CR loan. Now if RBI says that margin requirement needs to increase, that means if you have to get a 100 CR loan, you need to give collateral to the tune of 150 CR. That is you need to give me as a security something, let's say gold or any other jewelry of something to the tune of 150 CR. That means margin requirement has increased. So when RBI increases the margin requirement, that means they are discouraging loans. They are discouraging loans. And why they will discourage loans? If they want to reduce the money supply. Why would they want to reduce the money supply? If money supply is very, very high, that means if there is condition of inflation and RBI wants to combat inflation, they will increase the margin requirement. And if they will decrease the margin requirement, that means what they are trying to do, they are trying to combat deflation. And they are wanting to increase the levels of money supply. So it's as simple as that. That is your margin requirement. Now coming to the second last, that is moral suasion. Now moral suasion simply means that RBI is trying to persuade the commercial banks. So RBI is trying to persuade the commercial banks so that they will increase or decrease the interest rates based on the economic situation which is gauged by RBI. So it is just giving a dictum or it is just like giving some advice to the commercial banks which of course commercial banks can't ignore because that advice is given by the central bank of the country. 
So that is it about modal suasion. Now credit rationing. Credit rationing simply means that if in a certain sector, RBI is feeling that there is high level of inflation. So RBI will give a dictum or RBI will give advice to the commercial banks or will give, let's say, some circular to the commercial banks that you need to reduce lending to this particular sector. And if certain sector is facing deflation, RBI can issue an order that you need to increase the loan disbursement to this particular sector. So you need to give more loans to the sector. In that way, they are rationing the credit. That means they are selectively pushing in credit in different sectors. That is what credit rationing means. So all these instruments which we saw, that is repo rate, that is the rate at which central bank lends money to the commercial banks. Then the ratios, that is CRR cash reserve ratio, statutory liquidity ratio, cash, cash reserve ratio needs to be maintained with the RBI. SLR needs to be maintained with the commercial banks themselves. Then open market operations, that means buying and selling of the government securities by the RBI. Margin requirement, that is the difference between the loan amount and the collateral. Then moral suasion, that means persuasion. And credit rationing, that means giving loans to specific sectors. Rationing between sectors is what we call as the instruments of a monetary policy of Reserve Bank of India. Now, since this is very, very clear, we need to understand about one organization or one committee that is Monetary Policy Committee. Now, under the RBI Act of 1934, which was amended in 2016, this Monetary Policy Committee was formed. And it was formed under the Section 45ZB of this RBI Act of 1934. Now, this is empowered by the central government. Of course, they will constitute a six-member Monetary Policy Committee. But what will be the major aim or objective of this committee? The major aim will be to determine the policy rate. That means the repo rate to determine the policy rate which is required to achieve an inflation target. So with this monetary policy committee, what the central bank and the RBI is trying to do is inflation targeting. And what is the inflation target which they have? Inflation target is 4% plus minus 2%. That is 2 to 6% is the range of inflation which our country should have. And that is the target which is set by the Monetary Policy Committee. So 4% plus minus 2. And the decision of Monetary Policy Committee is binding on the Reserve Bank of India. And who is the ex-officio chairman? The ex-officio chairman of this Monetary Policy Committee is the RBI Governor. So I hope this Monetary Policy of India and Monetary Policy Committee, it is crystal clear to all of you. Now coming to the third topic of today, third topic is in relation to Myanmar's civil war. Now a few weeks ago, Arakan army captured Pelitwa in Chin state on Myanmar's western border with Bangladesh and India. Now this is a very huge development in relation to India's interest in Myanmar's civil war. That is why this topic becomes very, very important for us. We'll be trying to understand the whole of this Myanmar civil war and what are the interests of India in this regard. In relation to General Studies Paper 2, bilateral relations, this topic becomes very, very important. And bilateral groupings or agreements involving India or affecting India's interest, this topic becomes very, very important. Now, coming on to this civil war. Before we understand civil war, First, we need to understand the chronology and the timeline of events, what happened in Myanmar. So in 2010, what will happen in Myanmar is that the military backed this USDP, which is a political party in Myanmar, it will win elections by a landslide. And Aung San Suu Kyi, she will boycott, that is the National League for Democracy, her party, NLD, will boycott these elections. Now, after this, after three, four days after this, Aung San Suu Kyi will be freed after seven years of house arrest. Now, in 2011, there will be elected parliament which will convene for the first time in half a century in Myanmar. That will happen. Now, in 2015, four years after it, there will be again elections in Myanmar and NLD, that is National League for Democracy by Aung San Suu Kyi, will win the elections by a landslide in Myanmar. That will happen in 2015. And keeping this in my background, in 2020, again, elections will be held. Now, let us see the chronology of events from 2020 here on. Now, in November 3, 2020, the Army General of Myanmar, that is General Min Ong, will accuse the government of widespread violations in pre-voting procedures. 
that is before the voting is to be beginning before the voting is beginning the general min ong that is the army general of myanmar will accuse the government of a pre voting procedure violations that means pre voting procedures there are widespread violations in the run up to the election now in november 9 the election result will be announced and this national league of democracy will claim a resounding victory now remember this nld national league for democracy is the party by ong san suu kyi right so it will win a resounding victory in the second democratic elections after your 2015 right now in november 11 two days after election results the main opposition which is your usdp which we saw here also that is your union solidarity and development party again which is backed by military remember so the opposition is backed by military and this national league for democracy will win the election in 2020 and the opposition party that is usdp will refuse to recognize the results because they will say there are widespread violations in the result now in january 26 of 2021 in the next year November 2020 elections were there after this in November 11 the opposition will say we will reject it now in January 26 2021 the next year army will threaten to uh, take action and over the alleged frauds that is what army will say now in January of 28 that is two days after army says so election commission of Myanmar will say that they will reject the allegations of vote fraud and they will say there was no voting fraud in the elections Now, of course army will be uh, army will be furious and in january 30 military will say that it will protect the constitution and act according to the law which means that there there is going to be military coup they are giving a signal of a going uh, of a potential military coup which is going to be happening in myanmar in january 30 they give a signal right and in february 1 that is two days after the signal ong san suu kyi and other office bearers of this national nld national league of democracy they will be arrested and one year emergency state of emergency will be declared in myanmar and that will be the start of a military coup in myanmar after the election results so what happens 2020 elections will be there ong san suu kyi's nld party will win the election the main opposition party that is your usdp will contest the election will say that we do not agree with the results right and this usdp will be backed by military so now military will also say that we don't agree with the results election commission will say that results are free and fair but army will refuse to accept it and then military will say that we will take the charge and we will do a military coup in myanmar and we will act according to the constitution we will act according to the law and we will protect the constitution so on february 1st of 2021 they will arrest all the office bearers of national league for democracy right and the this ong san suu kyi and other office bearers of the country's government also they will arrest them and there will be a military coup starting from february 1 of 2021 in myanmar so that is all about a military coup in myanmar now what we need to understand is military civil war or civil war in myanmar there is a military coup but what is how the civil war started in myanmar so the military junta in myanmar that is the military which did the coup is known as tatmadaw right now of course there will be widespread protest in the country pro democracy pro democracy people they will of course definitely go for protests there will be a crackdown on them there will be widespread dissent based on this military uh, coup in myanmar but they will crack down on dissent so this military junta that is tatmadaw they will do a heavy crack down on dissent they will Uh, pick up a lot of people and put them in jails right they will go for various uh, lathi charge and all the other firing and all all the other procedures which will be taking place so crackdown on dissent will be there crackdown on opposition groups will be there including your ethnic armed organizations eaos and other armed civilians because armed civilians and ethnic armed organizations they will rise uh, with pro democracy slogans and they will say we are pro democracy and we don't agree with this military coup so there will be a civil war which is going to be starting and the people's defense forces pdfs will be formed people defense forces will be formed and this will be to resist the military junta that is tatmadaw 
so there will be a civil war which will start after the military coup in Myanmar and this will be the start of civil war in Myanmar. Now as of 2023, Tatmadaw's unchallenged control will be dropped to 40%, just under 40% of the country. So the rest 60% will be the area where the people, that is pro-democracy people, they have gained the control or they are contesting or they are challenging the Tatmadaw in that 60% area. Just 40% of the country is left as of 2023, which is unchallenged under the Tatmadaw's rule. Now, October 2023, Tatmadaw will start facing manpower issues. There will be frequent desertions and there will be the low morale in Tatmadaw. Now, in October, what will happen again? October, what will happen? This People Defense Forces and Three Brotherhood Alliance. There will be alliance, that is Three Brotherhood Alliance, between the three key organizations in Myanmar. That is your Arakan Army which we just saw in the context also, then Myanmar National Democratic Alliance Army, then the Aung's National Liberation Army. So these three organizations will come up and form an alliance, that is Three Brotherhood Alliance, and they will, fo uh, they will fight against this Tatmadaw, that is military janta, right, in order to establish a democracy in Myanmar. So Three Brotherhood Alliance, that is very, very important. They will launch a major rebel offensive against Tatmadaw. And there will be operation, that is Operation 1027, which will be successful in taking 80 bases, 220 Janta positions and several towns by 28th November 2023. So that is how the military civil war or the civil war in Myanmar is, is panning out. Now, what we need to understand is that in relation to the civil war, what is the interest of India and what is at stake for India in this regard? So, first of all, the development which taken, which took place in Palitwa, where Arakan army has taken a control few weeks back. That is why it is in news that Arakan army has taken control of this Palitwa. So, what will be the impact of this on India? See, first of all, the impact will be in relation to your Kaladan Multimodal Transit Transport Project. Now, first we need to understand what is this Kaladan Multimodal Transit Transport Project. So, it's a first of all transit and a transport project, which is a multimodal and which will connect your Kolkata to Myanmar from Kaladan port to Sitwe port of Myanmar. So it is a multimodal transit project. That means it will involve your connection of ports. It will be involving inland water transport, IWT. It will involve construction of roadways as well. So there will be connection from Kolkata to Sitwe port in Myanmar. This is the first connection which we see. From Sitwe port to Palatwa, there will be a connection of inland water transport. And that will be 158 kilometer. From Kolkata to Sitwe port, it will be 530 kilometer, right? 539 kilometer. From Palatwa to, from Palatwa to Indo-Myanmar border, in, in Myanmar, there will be road connectivity of 110 kilometer. And from border to NH54, that is Lawangtai, which is over here, there will be connectivity in relation to 100 kilometer road, which will be built. And all this put together is what your Kaladan multimodal project looks like. So if you see your map over here, Kolgata is being connected to Sitwe, then Palitwa, and then this Azawal, right? So this is how Kaladan multimodal project is ongoing. And it is, of course, ongoing currently, right? But the problem is, now, first of all, you need to understand what's the purpose. The purpose is that they want to create an alternative rule, route. Alternative route to connect northeast and mainland India. So, of course, you see from here the connectivity is going to Myanmar and ultimately it is being connected to northeast. That is a much faster route rather than depending just on this Siliguri corridor, the narrow corridor which connects mainland India with that of northeast. Rather than just depending on the Siliguri corridor, we are trying to diversify the area of connectivity between mainland India and that of northeast region. In this regard, this Kaladan multimodal transit transport project becomes very, very important for us. But what is the cause of concern? That this Palatwa region has been occupied by a Rakan army. Now, why this is a problem for us? Because allegedly, this Arakan army is opposing the Kaladan multimodal project. 
And also one more thing, there have been several reports that this Arakan army is being supported, funded and being getting military equipments from that of China. So now the role of China also becomes very much prominent over here. And recently there was a ceasefire also which was brokered between the military junta that is Tatmadaw and the other people's forces by the China itself. So the ceasefire agreement was brokered by China. That means China is also having a very important role to play in Myanmar. And our stakes in Myanmar are also very huge because development of our northeast region is dependent on this Kaladan multimodal project. So in this regard, India's stake and India's interest in what are, the, what are the progressions happening in Myanmar becomes very, very high. That is why we need to understand what is at stake for India. Right? I hope this is very, very clear to all of you. Now, coming to the last topic of today, that is in relation to the snow leopard. Now, the snow leopard's population assessment in India has estimated there are close to 718 snow leopards in India. Now, in relation to a general studies paper 3, environment and ecology, conservation word have been mentioned. So, conservation of wildlife species, the snow leopard becomes very, very important. Now, first, what we need to know is, what is the conservation status of snow leopard? So, under the IUCN red list, it is categorized under the vulnerable section. Under sites that is Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species, it is listed in Appendix 1. Under Wildlife Protection Act of 1972, it is listed under Schedule 1 of Wildlife Protection Act. That means it is getting the highest level of protection under the Wildlife Protection Act. Now, coming about the region in the Central Asia where this uh, snow leopard is located. So it's located in the region of Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, Mongolia, Tajikistan, China, Nepal, Bhutan, India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. In these regions, snow leopard could be found. But let's talk about India. So in India, close to six states are there where snow leopards are found. First is your Ladakh. It's a union territory. Then Uttarakhand then Himachal Pradesh, Arunachal Pradesh, Sikkim and again Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. So in Ladakh, you find the highest number of snow leopards. It's estimated to be 477. In Uttarakhand, it's estimated to be 124. In Himachal Pradesh, it is the third highest, that is 51. In Arunachal Pradesh, it is 36. In Sikkim, it is just 21. And in Jammu Kashmir Union Territory, it is 9 snow leopards which have been estimated. So, altogether 718 estimated population of snow leopard in India. Right? Now, what we need to understand is about snow leopard the habitat of it, the characteristics, the features of snow leopard. So, first of all, the scientific name is Penthera uncia. Penthera uncia is the scientific name of your snow leopard. Now, they are having thick fur which can range from the color of grey to white with the black spots and rosettes. So, they are having black spots or rosettes which are arranged in irregular patterns. See why I am telling you all these specifications of snow leopard because recently only in the last year's UPSC Civil Service Examination prelims paper, there was a question on fishing cat, right? Or also on various other species as well, question have been asked. That is why it becomes important for us. Okay. Now, they have a long, heavy tail that can be used for balance and that can be used for blanket to keep them warm. They are also having short legs, broad and flat faces. Short legs, broad, flat faces and also what one very important fact that they are solitary animals and they like to go out and they are most active in dawn and the dusk time. So that is some information about snow leopard. Now coming to the habitat of snow leopard, they are primarily found in the region of high altitude mountain ranges. So high altitude mountain ranges, for example, Himalayas, regions in India such as Ladakh, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, somewhere, some regions in Jammu and Kashmir, you will be able to find your snow leopard. Now, food habits, they are strictly carnivores. They can eat your blue sheep, wild sheep, ibex, marmots, pikas, deers and other small animals. So, they prey on these small mammals. They are carnivores in nature, right? And what are the various potential threats on them? Of course, they are under the vulnerable uh, category. What are the potential threats to snow leopard? So, potential threat can be human intrusion into their habitat 
or residential development which can be a threat to their habitat then energy production and mining and agriculture aquaculture practices are the most common threats to snow leopard their average height is 1.5 meter average weight is 55 kg generation length is close to 7.54 years and average estimated lifespan is close to 10 years for snow leopard and population is close to 2700 to 3300 some places you will find it 4000 as well some places close to 5000 as well that is the estimated population of snow leopards in the entire world i hope this topic is also very very clear to all of you so thank you for watching this lecture have a very very nice day